You might have heard of this traditional American folk song. Picking up pawpaws, put them in your pocket. Picking up pawpaws, put them in your pocket. Picking up pawpaws, put them in your pocket. Way down yonder in the pawpaw patch. Hi, I'm Sullivan Kaufman. I'm at Adkins Arboretum today in Ridgely, Maryland. And today I want to introduce you to the pawpaw. Now it's mid-April right now, and so the pawpaw doesn't have very many leaves on it yet. And you can see that it's just starting to leaf out here, and the flowers are, are blooming as well. Pawpaws belong to the Ananaceae, a large family with 130 genera and 2,300 species of trees and shrubs distributed around the world in tropical and subtropical environments. The one exception is the genus Asimina. All eight Asimina species occur in North America. Six of them range only as far north as Florida and Georgia, but Asimina triloba ranges as far north as southern Ontario, Canada. Asimina parviflora, the dwarf pawpaw, ranges just up to Virginia, but only along the coastal plain. Asimina fossils date to the Eocene about 56 to 34 million years ago and Asimina triloba to the Miocene 25 to 5.3 million years ago. So it's a plant that's been around a long time. Before people arrived in North America, scientists think the fruits were dispersed by the megafauna, animals like the giant ground sloth and mastodons. Native Americans may have moved the fruit northwards as well after they arrived on the continent. Pawpaws are most commonly found in deciduous forests in moist but well-drained soil, although they seem to be spreading into new areas recently. Pawpaws tend to spread by underground runners into dense patches, but sometimes you find individual trees. Each stem or trunk can grow up to about 30 feet. Usually the trunks are pretty skinny, but they can get up to a foot in diameter if they're really happy. The bark on the trunk can be dark brown or light gray and has sparse lentil soles, air pores. The bark tends to get kind of warty with age. Twigs are brown and smooth. The leaf buds look like little flames, and the flower buds are rounded. The large leaves give this tree a very tropical appearance. They can grow up to 12 inches long and tend to hang down when mature. The upper surface is smooth and hairless, but on younger leaves you might find hairs on the undersides of the leaves. The leaves have a wedge-shaped base and a bluntly pointed tip. The edges of the leaves are smooth, and they're arranged alternately along the stems. They turn a lovely soft yellow color in fall. Leathery flowers bloom early to mid-spring, and they consist of three green sepals, three outer petals, and three inner petals. The petals are a dark maroon or reddish brown color, and the flowers are about a half inch across. When the flowers first open, the pistils appear, they're followed many days later by the male flower parts, the stamens. Since the male and female parts of the flower mature at different times, the flowers will not self-pollinate. In fact, there's probably best fruit set when two genetically different plants or cultivars in an orchard cross-pollinate. The dark purple color and an odor described as slightly fetid or more appealingly like raisins attracts flies as the primary pollinators. Carrion beetles may also act as pollinators. The fruits are the largest in North America, although I think the Osage orange must be a close second. They grow in a small cluster, usually two to four fruits, and the green skin turns light green to pale yellow as the fruit ripens. The fruits bruise black easily as they mature. A mature fruit might be three to six inches long. The skin is bitter tasting, but the flesh inside is sweet and soft. Described as tasting, like a cross between bananas, mangoes, and pineapples. Some people like them better than others, and a word of warning, some people are allergic to the fruits, the fruit skin, or even the pawpaw leaves. Twigs and leaves contain acetogenins, including, including ananasin, wax-like fatty acid derivatives. Acetogenins are mitochondrial poisons that inhibit cellular energy production. The large fruits are eaten by raccoons, squirrels, possums, skunks, deer, bear, and box turtles. Not many animals eat the leaves because of the toxins they contain. Not even deer will eat them. Crush one in your hand and smell the sharp, unpleasant odor. 
Maybe that's why it's been spreading into new habitats. There are, though, three moth and butterfly species that eat pawpaw leaves. Omphalocera monroei, the Asamina webworm moth, Dolba hyloeus, the pawpaw sphinx, and the best known, the zebra swallowtail, Eurydides marcellus. The pawpaw sphinx also feeds on some holly species. Zebra swallowtail is of course named for its black and white striped wings. Evolutionary biologists think that the zebra swallowtail co-evolved with Asamina triloba because both are almost the sole representatives of their group in temperate North America. Adult zebra swallowtails lay eggs on the young pawpaw leaves or bark in spring and the caterpillars consume acetogenins from the leaves in such quantity that the protective effects are carried over to adult butterflies. If a bird tried to eat a caterpillar, it would vomit and possibly die. The name Asimina seems to be derived from the Native American name for the fruit. In addition to eating the fruits, Native Americans used to use the fibrous inner bark to make rope, nets for fishing, and cloth. The name pawpaw probably came from early Spanish explorers who thought the fruit resembled the papaya. The first reference to the fruit came from Hernando de Soto's expedition through the Mississippi Valley in 1541. The chronicler noted that the Indians planted them and that the fruits had an excellent flavor. The French called them by the rather rude name testiculi asini as, they, as often the fruits hang in pairs. Explorers Lewis and Clark may have been saved by the pawpaw. William Clark wrote in his journal, Our party entirely out of provisions, subsisting on pawpaws, we divide the biscuit which amount to nearly one biscuit per man, this, in addition to the pawpaws, is to last us down to the settlements, which is 150 miles. The party appear perfectly contented and tell us that they can live very well on the pawpaws. That's from Lewis and Clark's 1806 journals. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson grew the fruits at their estates in Virginia. For the home landscape, you can find cultivars selected for better tasting fruits, or you can take a chance and grow your own from seed. In the center of the fruit are two rows of large brown seeds. Don't eat the seeds as they contain a powerful alkaloid. If you want to grow your own pawpaw from seed, be sure to stratify the seeds before planting. This means they need to sit in cold, moist conditions for 90 to 120 days before they'll germinate. Seedlings and young plants should be grown in a partially shaded site, but more mature trees can tolerate full sun and will produce more fruit in full sun. They prefer moist but well-drained, organically rich soils and can be hard to transplant because they have a long taproot. But once established, they're pretty hardy. Just remember that you need two cultivars or two genetically distinct trees to get cross-pollination in fruits. I hope you get to taste a pawpaw this fall way down yonder in the pawpaw patch. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel and feel free to leave any comments or questions in the comment section below. Sweet to me, baby, sweet to me.